Okay, so during our last lecture, we couldn't finish with our discussion on physical and cognitive development. We had finished with the physical development, but we couldn't do the cognitive development. And so this video lecture is supposed to compensate for what we are supposed to do under cognitive development. Now we'll be looking at three theories or three aspects of cognitive development. We'll do the theory by Piaget, we'll talk about Vygotsky, and then we'll add intelligence. Now, Jean Piaget um, came up with a theory of cognitive development, and he postulated or stated that intelligence change as children grow. And every individual moves through four different stages of what mental development. And that is why there were some concepts or things that were difficult to understand as children. But as we age, we are able to understand them. And so the four stages that Piaget talked about were the sensory motor stage. That is from about birth to 24 months or two years. He also talked about the pre-operational stage from two to seven years, the concrete operational stage from seven to 11 years, and the formal operational stage from 12 years above. Now, Piaget's theory focuses not only on how you know children acquire knowledge, but also the nature of their intelligence. And so he calls uh, the first stage, for instance, the sensory motor stage, at that level, children have what we call sensory motor intelligence. Uh, same applies for uh, pre-operational stage where he talks about the fact that they have pre-operational intelligence. Now, uh, Piaget says that the sequence of the stage is universal across cultures and follow the same unchanging order. What it means is that whether a child is born in Africa or in Ghana, it is the person is born in South Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, in the US, in Asia, in UK, in Japan, wherever the child might be, every child goes through these four stages of what? Cognitive development. Just that the rate at which they go through might vary from one child to another. And so let's take each of the stages and see what Piaget talks about there. Now, the first stage is the sensory motor stage. And so like the name suggests, sensory and motor. So the, the, the stage talks about children's intelligence that is based on sensory information that they receive and also was the motor movements that they, they make. And so sensory motor intelligence refer to the way infants think. And we talk about infancy as the period that is spanning between zero to two years. And so the children or the infants use their senses and their motor skills to make sense of the world. Now, um, according to Piaget, children have intelligence through their interactions with objects within their world environment. And as they are interacting with objects within their environment, they build what we call schemas or mental models of how the world works and how the world would evolve and the interaction between different elements of nature. And so it is that schema that allows the child to build more cognitive what, models to be able to what, understand complex concepts. And so under the pre-operational stage, uh, Piaget says that there are six sub-stages. Now, the first one is from zero to one month, where the child is engaging in what we call reflexes. We talk about reflexes in our past lesson. Now, after reflexes, between about one to four months, the child has what we call the affairs adaptations. So adaptation involves the child changing, you know, to meet situational demands. And when we talk about adaptation, it involves two processes. So we are talking about assimilation and accommodation. So someone may ask, 
what is assimilation and what is accommodation. So assimilation is the application of previous concepts to new concepts. So for example, um, let's say a child has seen a type of fish that is called what tilapia. And then subsequently, the child sees salmon. But because he knows that all of them, they have almost the same feature, he's likely to call what the salmon also as tilapia. Now, he is using his previous knowledge of what, what a fish is, and he is using that to adjust to the new concepts or to understand the new concepts. And so that is assimilation. Now, accommodation is when the child has to alter previous concepts in the face of what new information. So an example is, you know, the child knowing that although this also has the same shape as the, uh, the tilapia, it has head, it has eyes, it has a tail, it has scales on it, etc. Not every fish is what tilapia, right? And so there are some that have what other names based on their distinctive fishes. And so even with fish, there are differences. And so when the child begins to alter a previous concept that they already have to make way for new information, we call that what? Accommodation. So accommodation and assimilation together form what we call what? The adaptation. So gradually, the child will begin to see, you know, filter new information using old concepts or alter old concepts to allow for what new information to come in. Now, during the test stage, Piaget talks about children having make, uh, making interesting sites last or responding to people and objects. So for example, when somebody mentions their name, they laugh or they clap their hands. Now, during the fourth stage, which is about eight to 12 months, the child has what we call new ad adaptations. And so they become more deliberate and purposeful in responding to people and objects. And that is why they can even be able to discriminate between faces. And so when the child is crying previously, when someone else carries the child, you know, they are okay. They were crying and somebody carried them. So they, they are not able to tell if this is my mother, this is my father, et cetera. They, once somebody carries them, they are okay. But at this stage, they are able to know that this is my mother, right? And this is my father. They are able to discriminate. And so they can purposefully decide that if it is not my mother that is carrying me, I'll continue crying until my mother carries me. And so the child becomes more deliberate and purposeful in responding to people or objects. Now, between So between 12 months to about 18 months, uh, the child develops new means through active experimentation, what we call um, little scientists or what Piaget termed as little sci scientists, where the child gradually actually learns to know more about the world by exploring things by themselves. And so, that is where they can you know, put their teddy bear in the toilet and flash it to see what will happen. They will open a whole box of noodles and empty it into their bathtub. Children are likely to go into the kitchen and you know, pour their bombies, um, milo and noodle all on the floor and you know, bath or bathe themselves in it. They are able to you know, take their mother's makeup and wrap it on their face and see how it will look like. Now, Piaget says that this experimentation and creativity actually helps the child to learn more about the world. Usually, when children at this stage engage in what these activities, they are either chastised in a way or punished in a way, which lets them know that, okay, this is not right and this is right to do. Now, between one and a half to about two years, the child now gains, you know, more sophisticated ways of thinking. So before you go and empty the, the can of meal or the tin of meal, the child would think before doing it because the previous time he did that, whilst he was experimenting, 
the mother was gave him a little part at the back. And so the child would develop new ways of uh, achieving uh, goals without resorting towards try and error. So usually by the end of this stage, children will have what we call object permanence. And it's actually the realization that things or people or objects still exist if they are no longer seen or touched or heard. So for example, if your child was about three months and uh, the child is playing with your phone, then you hide the phone. The child cries after some time and he, feel, he or she feels like the phone is born. But when that child is about one and a half years to about two months and you, he wants to play with your phone and you hide, the child will go looking for the phone because he knows that the fact that you have hidden the phone away from him that not means that the phone does not exist again. And so it means he might be hiding somewhere. And so he must look for it. And so that's what we call object permanence. And so here in this picture, you see that the child and the adults were playing with an object. The, the adults hid the object under the mat. And the child does not make an effort to look for it. But as he was aging, when the same thing was done, he was stretched out his hand to look be beneath the mat or the covering to pick whatever that was there. And so that is an example of object permanence. Now, when we come to the pre-operational um, stage, which is the second stage, Piaget says that children have what we call pre-operational thoughts. Pre-operational thoughts or intelligence uh, it's, you know, the second stage. Now, the use of pre indicates that at this stage, children don't have what we call or do not use what we call logical thinking or logical reasoning in processing information. Now, however, by this stage, children by two years, most children were have what began talking. And so language skills enables children to have what we call symbolic thoughts. And symbolic thought is when an object or word stands for something else, including something out of sight or imagine. So words or objects can be used to symbolize another action or another object. So for example, the child can be, you know, using a mob to represent what a horse, right? Or they can be using their toy car to represent a normal car that they are driving. And so they can drive, you know, very fast, hit their their neighbor, etc. They could equally use a toy gun as what? A real what? Uh, gun that can kill people. And so that is why they play games and one person shoots the other and one person faints as if what? They are, they are dead. And so that play, they, in that play, they are using what? Symbolic thoughts. Now, symbolic thought also helps to what? Explain animism, which is the belief that Many young children have that natural objects or inanimate objects are alive and they can have the same characteristics as, you know, living things. And so, for example, they, they, they are not fascinated when they are watching a cartoon and they are seeing an animal talking or a tree talking, you know, etc. And so you have many children's storybooks including animals or objects that talk and listen. Because at that stage, the children would believe in animism. So they have the belief that natural objects can have animate or human characteristics. Under the pre-operational stage, children also um, have what we call centration, where they are you know, focused on only one aspect of a situation. So, a child cannot understand why their daddy is also somebody's brother or their mother is somebody's sister or somebody's daughter. They believe that their dad can only be their dad and not be their uh, what, somebody's sister at the same time. So in that situation, they are focusing on only what one aspect of the situation, right? My daddy is my dad. My daddy cannot be somebody's son. I am his son. Nobody else can be his son. And so that is an example of centration. So here, I have a picture here. The child is using the mop stick or the broomstick as what? 
a horse. So in his mind, as he's riding the broomstick, he's riding what? A horse. So this is an example of what? Symbolic thought. Now, centration also helps us to understand what, what we call child egocentrism or self-centeredness. It's because they focus on only one high aspect or side of a situation. They have the tendency to think you know, about other people and their own experiences as if everything revolves around them. So for example, if, if for example, something bad happens to a child's spirit, they are not thinking of, you know, how that is going to hurt someone else. They are only going to think of the benefits that they derive. So they are going to think about, so if daddy is no longer there, who is going to take me to the mall? Who is going to buy ice cream for me? They are not thinking about their mother that is also grieving by the absence of what their father, etc. And so that is what adolescent egocentrism. Now, pre-operational children also focus on appearance, right? So the child assumes that the visible appearance of something is also their essence. I think last time I was giving an example of how, you know, ch two children. You give them one CD, but you give one a coin and you give one paper notes. And the one that you give the coin will cry because they believe that paper notes are always what? You know, higher in value than the coin. So they are using the appearance, the visible appearance to determine the essence of the, or the value of the thing. So once a note is a coin, a, a currency is a coin, it means that what? Its value or its essence is lower compared to the notes. Now, pre-operational children also have what we call static reasoning, right? So they believe that nothing changes. So whatever is now should always be and should forever be. That is why children cannot understand why two days ago or one week ago you had money and now they want to buy ice cream or they want to buy a toy and you are telling them there's no money. They don't understand. They believe that once you had money two days ago, now you should have money in the future. Anytime they ask you anything, you should was always have money. Pre-operational children also engage in what we call reversibility. So in pre-operational thoughts, reversibility is the idea that change is permanent. And so nothing can be restored to the way it was before the change occurred. So for example, if you are playing the child is playing with a tablet or whatever, and you switch off the tablet, the child may assume that what the tablet is spot or may not function again. So they are likely to what to cry. But that action is reversible. You can equally put on the tablet and they will play again. But they believe that nothing can be restored back to the way it was. Or even if the tablet is damaged, it cannot be what repaired again. Now, another important thing that pre-operational children engage in is conservation. They lack conversa uh, conservation, sorry. Now, conservation is the principle that the amount of substance remains the same even when the appearance changes. Now, if you are giving two children drink, maybe you measure the same quantity, but you poured it in different cups or different containers, and one cup appear a little taller than the other, Although they saw you measure the same quantity, pre-operational children will not understand that they are the same quantity. And so the one whose own is taller who assume that their drink is more than the one whose own was, whose cup is shorter. And so usually when you are sharing things for children, it is important that you use the same cup or you use the same measurements where one child, or you give them the same thing, where one child will not feel like Yes, is more than the other, or yes, is less than the other. So, for example, if you take these two cups that the child is looking at, you see the taller one. It's 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 slender, but the other one is a bit bigger. But when you ask the child to tell you which of the drinks in these two is more than the other, the child is likely to point at what the taller one is because they lack what the principle of conservation. Right. 
But if the child grows, you know, to about the concrete operational stage, they know that it was the same quantity of drinks that was put in there. And so they will not say that one is more than the other. They'll be able to tell you that the quantity is the same. Now, the stage three is the concrete operational stage. So here, children are able to reason logically, unlike the previous stage, right? So they reason logically only about experiences that they can directly relate with or perception. So things they can see, things they can hear, things they can feel by themselves, not abstract things. And so here, the logical reasoning is about what direct experiences and perceptions and not about abstraction. So at this stage, you can ask children to classify things. So children can engage in what we call classification and simulation. So classification is, you know, you give them a, a host of objects or a list of objects, and you ask them to sort them according to, or to organize them according to what a category or class, right? So you can give them fruits, you can give them vegetables, and ask them to sort it into the two groups. You mix them. So sort out which ones are fruits and sort out which ones are vegetables. Concrete operational children would be able to do that. And that is why in, in concrete operational classes, they ask them to sort according to triangles, according to square. They, they should sort objects according to color, etc. Now, children at this stage too are able to do what we call seriation where they can arrange things in what? Ascending and descending order. So usually for these children, usually between seven to 11 years, their homeworks will be, they'll be given numbers, right? Some are smaller numbers, some are bigger numbers, and they are asked to arrange the numbers in, in order of what? In an ascending order or in a descending order. And that is what simulation. So here, in this picture, the child is what? Sorting the pebbles according to color. And so this is what classification. The child can classify things according to what? A specific color. Now, the last stage that Piaget talks about is the formal operational thought or intelligence. And this comes somewhere in adolescence from age 11 and above. Here, he actually believes that adolescents move past concrete operations to consider abstract thoughts so they can reason logically not only about direct experiences, but also about abstract things. So assumptions that do not have, you know, reality. So for example, you can, you can ask an adolescent to, let's assume you are a father. The person knows that he's not a father. But it is, that is not the reality. But the child can be able to what, imagine that and assume that what, per, uh, personality or that role just for the purpose of what, whatever discussion they are going to have. Now, formal operations is important because by now, children are able to do, you know, abstractions. For example, in mathematics, they are able to use this abstract concept to do logarithm, algorithms, etc. Now, under the form of operational thought or intelligence, adolescents also have what we call adolescent egocentrism, where they think that they are unique and other people are so focused on them. That is why adolescents are so focused about their appearance, right? There's also something that talked about what focus on appearance where adolescent thinks that they are so unique, other people are looking at them. And so an adolescent can be in the mirror, you know, admiring their own, you know, uniqueness for so long. And they also have what we call personal fable, which is the belief that their own emotions and experiences are so unique or more wonderful or awful than anyone else. So an adolescent can think that there's something about them that's so unique that other people don't have, particularly if they are good qualities. And the same applies when they are going through what difficulties. They might feel that their situation is the most awful or the worst that has ever what, existed. 
and that is part of the personal fable. They also have what we call the invisibility fable, where they believe that they cannot be harmed by anything that can defeat, you know, a normal mortal. And that is why adolescents engage in a lot of risky behavior. They you know that they don't know that having unprotected sex is wrong or using drugs is bad or high speed driving is no good. They know, but they believe that although those things are bad, they can harm other people, but they, that cannot harm them. And so a young lady that is having unprotected sex or a young guy, you ask them, do you know that you can have STDs? Or the lady, you ask them, do you know you can get pregnant? And they tell you that, oh, we know, but as for me, it won't happen to me, right? They feel they're invisible to the effect of whatever harm that the activity that they are engaging in can cause. Now, they also have what imaginary audience, right? So it's part of the egocentric belief. So that is the belief, you know, people are watching their appearance, their ideas, and their behavior. So adolescents will be very peculiar about what? They are so, at this stage, they are so peculiar or they are so concerned about their body image. How am I looking? Is everything nice? And so they can wear a dress and they'll ask for your validation or approval more than three times before they step out of the house because they want to know if their appearance is okay, if, if their behavior, everything is fine. Okay. Now, and the formal operational thought or intelligence you also have hypothetical thoughts right so you can give propositions that do not reflect reality and they are able to understand i think i've said that earlier adolescents can also do what we call deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning so for deductive reasoning it's called top-down processing where they can deduce you know um logical statements or able to figure out specifics from more general premises. And then for inductive reasoning, you know, they are able to use, you know, experiences or facts to arrive at what general conclusion. We call that bottom-up what reasoning. So I have a picture here that shows inductive and deductive reasoning. So for example, all men are mortal and that deductive reasoning if we say that the idea is that all men are mortal, right? It means that all men will die someday, right? And so if a certain man, which is called Simon, uh, is, you know, identified as a man, it means that what? Simon is what? Mortal. And so we are using a general premise and we are making deductions from it or conclusions from it. But under inductive reasoning, you make observations, you analyze, and you come up with a general conclusion. So, for example, somebody's hand got bent from a horse stove, right? And all stoves work the same way. It means that you should be careful around stove because it is likely that what you get what bent from touching a horse stove. So that's the difference between deductive and inductive reasoning. Now, and that ends what Piaget's theory. There's another theorist called Vygotsky. And Vygotsky talked about social learning, right? So he, he didn't talk about, you know, you maturing before you get a certain level of what intelligence. But he stressed that intelligence or cognition or our thinking capacity develops as a result of what? our social interactions. And so he stressed the importance of social interactions. He stressed the importance of culture. So he believes that the individual does not learn in isolation. It's not only about, okay, you mature to a certain age, then you get an understanding of things that you previously did not understand. So he was opposed in a way to what? By God, um, Piaget's no theory, right? And so he talks about en engagement, right? Collaboration, social relation. All these things help to acquire language. So for example, for you to be able to learn, you need what we call a mentor. Somebody who will teach you, who will guide you, who will help and learn, uh, what, who will lend a helping hand to you 
to master a skill. For example, for you to be able to understand this concept in psychology, you have a lecturer that is teaching you. And so that lecturer is serving as what? Your mentor to master the concepts or the knowledge. And so sometimes, although there is knowledge that you can acquire on your own, it needs what? The, the, the social interaction to be able to work, to master it. Vygotsky also talks about what? Our surrounding. As we learn from what? What others do. And so it's not only about the child themselves. So he talks about the model. He also talks about other children who helps what? Um, their colleagues to learn. And that is why in class, sometimes you are asked to work in what? You are asked to work in groups, right? That group work idea stems from Vygotsky's you know, concept of what is called zone of personal development, where he says that, you know, for every child, there is, you know, what they can do, right? And what they cannot do. But between what they can do and what they cannot do is an area or a zone that is called the proximal zone of development, where he believes that with a little assistance, right, or with a needed push from a colleague or someone who better understands that concept, the child should be able to what, do it without what, any help. And so he believes that children should go through what we call scaffolding. So you provide temporary support and this support is tailored towards to help the learner to be, to be able to do what they cannot do previously. So for example, in this circle, you have here what the child can do, right? What the child cannot do, that is what is outside. Now, within the inner circle is what the child can do by themselves. Vygotsky believes that with the necessary support, right, children should be able to do what is after this box with the help of what? Someone. And so this area is what we call the zone of proximal development. Now, when you look at Piaget's theory, Piaget's theory is only focused on what the child can do. But Vygotsky is saying that when you allow to the child to do only what they can do, they are limited. But with the push or with the assistance of a friend or a mentor or a colleague, the child can do some things that are outside what the scope of what they can do with that assistance. And so children should not be pushed to just stay in their comfort zone or what they can do by themselves, but to go beyond that and to seek help to do a little above what, what they are comfortable with. And so basically, that is Piaget, uh, Vygotsky's theory of cognitive development.